The joy of the Lord is in this house this weekend. Uh, the joy of the Lord is in the house. But I say it every year. It comes around to this time of the year. And people start worshiping a bit differently. I say it every year. Every year I say it. Comes around to this time of the year and my microphone goes off. There it is. Comes around this time of year and, and man, people start worshiping differently. People start clapping like this. People start worshiping like this. Man, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. It's very strange. Feel the tension in the air around this time of the year. It is college football season. Pray for the Gators, y'all. They need it. And um, man, it was so wonderful to see all the youth up here this morning. Just, I mean, they just came out and just began to worship the Lord. I just want to remind, hey man, we're a church for every age and stage of life. And let nobody despise our youth, young people. God is doing amazing. Let me just encourage you with this. Well, was, uh, we're out for coffee with a few friends, myself and Sarah, on Thursday night. It was, about late, it was later. It was like 9 p.m. We were out having coffee. We were in Panera Bread. And uh, we walked in there, and there was these uh, guys, a bunch of guys who were sitting down. They had their Bibles out, and they were reading their Bible. And uh, they were just going in deep into the Word. And they came over, and they just said, hey, are you the pastor of the Springs Church? And I said, yeah, yeah I'm the pastor of the Springs Church. And they were like, man, we've been attending for the last few weeks. Uh, we love what God is doing, and we're really w wanting to dig into God's Word and be in a place where there's discipleship happening. Well, this morning, the first service, there was about 20 of them that came into church this morning, all hungry, all ready for the Word of the Lord. And Pastor Jesse said to me this before service, he said, in the young adults group right now, they have 53 people that are signed up to go through a year-long discipleship course in our church. I think that's worth giving God praise for this morning. <laughs> the hunger that's there in this place. And so, this... This uh, holiday weekend, I just really want to hone in on, on a topic here, friendship. And I think this is important in the church because I do believe this is worth addressing on a regular basis right now because this is such a, this is such a pandemic, if you would, that's happening um, in our nation of loneliness and people who are searching for friendship. Uh, I think that that's one of many reasons people show up to churches are searching for, for friendship. They're searching for friendship. And biblical friendship reflects the character and the nature of God and his desire for relationship with us and that he calls us friends. Isn't that incredible, church, this morning? That he would call us friends. And here in Proverbs 18, it says, a man who finds himself, finds friends, must himself be friendly. Now, if you open up your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 18, we're gonna look through one of the most famous friendships in Bible, maybe in literature through history, is the friendship of Jonathan and David, the friendship of Jonathan and Dave, David and Jonathan, uh, that has been un, uh, that's been looked at as an example of friendship through the ages. And we're going to talk about a, a authentic friendship along with our series today. Authentic friendship honors, uh, authentic friendship helps, and authentic friendship heals. We're going to start this morning with authentic friendship honors, and this is out of First Samuel chapter eighteen, verse one to four, and it says this that. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant. They made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, in this story, the context is, is that David has gone from being a shepherd boy to where Samuel has laid his hands on him and anointed him as the future king over Israel to overtake Saul to be the king. Da David has gone out and he has fought with Goliath, this giant that gave courage to all of the Israelites to pursue the Philistines and to, to, to feed them. And this little, this young boy comes and he, he's brought into the public scene very quickly. And Jonathan, who is the rightful heir to the throne, comes and has this establishing of a friendship with, with David in the most amazing way. And I think that there's something that we can learn that's so pivotal and so important for every one of us as we walk through this world that is, is facing such a challenge with loneliness and searching for friendship. Now, watch what happens here because not only was their souls knit together and did they make covenant with one another, but Jonathan enters into something that gives you an indication of the establishment of making friends. Here's what he does. Number one is he gives 
He gives David his robe. He gives David his robe. Now remember, Jonathan is royalty. Jonathan comes from privilege. Jonathan comes from heir to the throne. So when he gives David his robe, he is expressing to David that there is no competition between me and you. He's saying there's no competition between you and, you and me. In other words, there's no superiority between me and you. There was an article that I came across, or not an article, a book that I came across called From Strength to Strength by uh, an author called uh, Arthur Brooks, Dr. Arthur Brooks, and he works at Harvard. He is a psychologist and a sociologist, and he wrote this book about tracking how people go through different seasons in their life and how they navigate the different seasons. And on the topic where he's talking about people who are transitioning towards the end of their career into the latter end of their career, close to retirement, the challenges they walk through. And he came across there's, uh, this portion of the book where he talks about coming into contact with a woman that's about his age and the, uh, coming out of her career, a very successful career in Wall Street. And she, she hears about Dr. Arthur Brooks's work and reaches out to him for help. And as he digs into her life, she'd been very successful on Wall Street, but he found out that she, had, she was overworking herself and was feeling physically drained all the time. She was in a position where she had much success, but she was, she, her marriage was in a very difficult place. He found out that she had children and grandchildren, but they were distant at best. She found, they, he found out that she had looked at different substances and got addicted to them in order to be able to cope with some of the stress and the things that she was dealing with. She was finding herself in a place of constant cycle of unhappiness. And as he addressed this with her, he said, it seems like the source of your problem is obvious. Why don't you pull back from work? Why don't you work on your health? Why don't you get a help for your addiction? Why don't you spend more time with your family? Why don't you work on your marriage to improve these things, the source that's causing you to be so unhappy in your life? And she responded back to him after thinking about it. And I just want to read this quote to you because she, it says this. She thought about my question for a couple of minutes. Finally, she looked at me and said, matter of factly, maybe I would prefer to be special rather than happy. Now, I want to say that one more time because I think that this is profound. And this is a barrier between having association or having fellowship and entering into friendship. Here it is. Maybe I would prefer to be special rather than happy. See, in her life, she had built up such an image, she had built up a, such a reputation as somebody that she felt like she had to maintain that in her mind she had come to the conclusion she would rather be special than she would be to be happy. Now, that's an extreme situation that I think that at times we can all fall into that trap where we think to ourselves that we are better or we are more esteemed or we're of a higher nobility or whatever it is than, than it is to enter into friendship. This can happen in ministry. This can happen in, 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 in across the board when it comes to relationships. But we need to take a look at what happens with Jonathan and David. Because Jonathan had the privileged position. Jonathan had the superiority. Jonathan had the, 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 the status as being special. But what Jonathan does is he gives his robe over to David to say, there is no competition between me and you. There is no, there is no um, um, superiority between me and you. And it didn't stop there. Not only did he give him his robe, but he also gave him his armor. He gave him his armor. He gave him that which protected what was on the inside. In other words, he was not just going to be in a place of defense all the time, but he was willing to let David in to what was on the inside. He wasn't just going to protect himself. See, in order to be, have friends, you've got to prove yourself to be friendly, church. And to prove yourself friendly, sometimes you've just got to let people in. You've got to allow yourself to be vulnerable with some, some other people. And, and, da and Jonathan comes and he gives him his armor. Think about that. The third thing he does is he gives him his sword. That's a picture of offense. He, he, said to, he was saying to David, you have no worry, worries about being threatened by me. My weapons are not going to be used against you. I'm not going to use what I have, my strength, in order to bring you down. I'm not using what I have to tear you down. The next thing he gives him is his bow. That bow represented from a distance what he could shoot from far away when nobody could see or nobody could visualize what was coming from a distance. In other words, our friendship 
You can have a safety in knowing that whatever you've entrusted to me, I'm going to protect you from a distance. When you can't see me, I got your back. When I'm in another room, I got your back. When I'm in another place, I got your back. I'm not going to reveal what's going on. I'm going to protect you even when you can't see me. The final thing that uh, Jonathan gives to David is he gives him his belt. Now a belt represented in this time, it represented military victories. And he gave him this belt and it represented that whatever my victories are, they're your victories, David. And whatever victories that you have, they're my victories, David. This was a friendship that was established in a place of covenant where Jonathan came across the threshold and brought David in by saying, I'm laying down my superiority. I'm laying down uh, my, my protection. I'm laying down that place where I can threaten you. I'm laying down that, a position that I can tear you down from a distance. And whatever victory I have, that will be our victory together. What a beautiful picture of friendship. An establishment of a friendship. A friend who himself is showing himself to be friendly as Proverbs write, I want to let you know, church, today, friendship is a journey that's worth going on even when you don't know where it's going to lead to. Jonathan and David made, came into a covenant because Jonathan loved him as his own soul. See, there's not only a picture of this of a beautiful, beautiful verti or, uh, um, vertical relationship, but also a horizontal one as well. It represents the friendship that Christ has shown towards us, his church, his people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul would say it like this. He would say, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, you know, you know what it is because you know who you are and you know how gracious Jesus has been to you. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. He, uh, um, there was a crossing of the threshold that Jesus would come, leave the glory of heaven, leave the richness of the glory of heaven, that he might become poor so that he might broker the covenant through the cross, through the death, through the resurrection, so that we might be called friends of God today. How many of you today on this Labor Day weekend are grateful that you have a friendship with Jesus because he made a way for you? So you might be like today, well, I got that. I got friends. I got my sisters. I got my brothers. I got my, I got my homies. I got whatever. I got the lads. I got, I, got what it's, I got what you're talking about. They're my people. You got a friend in me. You might be saying that this morning. But I'll tell you what, there's a friendship that honors, but there's also a friendship that is tested, that lasts the test. That lasts the test. Authentic friendship not only honors, but it also, it helps. And here we're going to see that two chapters later, there's a test to this friendship. The rubber meets the road in this friendship. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1, the context is, is that people begin to sing about David, about how Saul had killed his thousands, but David had killed his tens of thousands. And Saul gets jealous, and he begins to try to pin David against the wall. And he's fleeing, David is fleeing from Saul, and he runs to Jonathan. And we pick up the story in chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Then David fled from Nayat to Ramah, and went and said to Jonathan, what have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father? And he seeks my life. In other words, David is coming and he is freaking out to his friend. What's going on? My life is over. What's happening? Why is this happening to me? And he just begins to unload all the challenges and difficulties that he's going through. There's a testing of the friendship. It's a friendship that is going to go from Facebook friends to, to faithful friends. It's a testing of friendship. Because Proverbs will speak of this in friendship again in Proverbs 17, 17. That a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity, for the day of challenge, for the day of, of trouble. And so when David comes, he's freaking out. He's, he's so burdened. You've got to think about this for a moment. David is coming who, see it's one thing. But let me put it this way. It's one thing for Jonathan to love David and honor him when he's a hero after defeating Goliath. It's another thing for Jonathan to love and pursue friendship with David when he's hopeless. In this moment, he's not the hero who's defeated Goliath. 
He is the man who's hopeless and he's fleeing for his life and he is absolutely going through a pit in his life and there's a different moment that has, that's happening here. See, I've got a question for you, church, today. Who is your support system? Where are your people? Where are your friends in your day of trouble that you can come knocking on the door no matter what hour of the day it is or what hour of the night it is that you can come and begin to unload and see I'm so grateful that I can cast my burdens upon the Lord but I'm also grateful for his church and I'm grateful for people that God brings along the journey that we can call friends. I'm grateful that there are some people that we can sometimes come when the burdens are so heavy and the things are overwhelming that we can come and literally unload those things onto. Because, listen, if we don't have those people in our life, we're going to unload in the wrong place. We're going to unload in the wrong It reminds me of one day when Sarah uh, had made this beautiful shepherd's pie and she had made it in this Pyrex dish. And she said, can you take this Pyrex dish from the countertop to the table and I went to put my hands in the pirate sticks and it was piping hot and I went to take it to the table Sarah says you got that I said I got that I'm a man I've been to Planet Fitness twice this month I got it and so I said I'm going to take this pirate I'm going to bring it there I'm walking along and I'm halfway between the countertop and the table and I recognized I was too far to go back and it was too it was too far to get there that pirate dish and that shepherd's pie it felt the floor that day I landed it in the wrong place at the wrong time and it unloaded everywhere and created a mess. Listen, when we don't have a place, the right place to land some of the things that are too hot for us to handle, things that are too difficult for us, it will end up in the wrong place. You'll get on Facebook one day and it will say right there on the top, what would you like to say? Mm. <laughs> what would I like to say? And you'll say everything you shouldn't say. You'll be going through drive through you'll be getting your favorite coffee, uh, it's outside of Springs coffee. You'll be going through your favorite coffee, and you'll be, you'll be going through the drive through one day, and the lady on the other side will say, hey, how can I help you today? And you'll be like, I just got so much I got to say. I got to tell you about everything that's happening. You don't know what Pastor Mapool has done to me. Let me just tell you everything that's going on. And you just begin to unload everything that's going on. Now, he killed two rattlesnakes yesterday. I just want to let you know that. So anyway, never mind. Anyway, it's nothing to do with my message. Let's keep going. You'll begin to unload in all the wrong places. You'll begin to take, and you'll leave a mess everywhere. But David runs to Jonathan in his day of trouble, and Jonathan is prepared to help. Think about it for a moment. In this moment, Jonathan could have ignored David and be like, David, you're crazy. You're talking about my dad. You're talking about the kingdom. You're crazy. I'm just going to keep on moving and keep on walking. But Jonathan doesn't. He responds. He listens to what David has got to say. It's amazing because when you think about it, Jonathan could have taken advantage of this moment and said, this is my time to get the kingdom. This is my time to get what I want. Because Jonathan had to make a choice between God's anointed and man's anointed. He had to make a choice between what God was doing through David's life and what was, what was becoming of Saul. He had to make a very important, he could have at that moment in time, I know that his kingdom is going to be handed and rightfully out of lineage, I should be getting this position. I can use this as an opportunity to, to take advantage of this moment, but he doesn't. He reasons with David. He reasons with David. He could have ended David's life right here by going back to Saul and his entourage and saying, here's where David's at, here's what's going on in his life, and they could have come and they could have gotten David, but Jonathan does it. He responds by loving and by caring and by, by being there for his friend. Here's the thing I want to address to you, church, today. I want to step on some toes for just a moment. Oh, everybody okay with having your toes stepped? I want to talk about friendship within the church. I want to talk about friendship because sometimes we have... One of the reasons I think that there's such a, a challenge with, with, with church hopping, I'm just going to put it like that for a moment, just, la just people going from one place to another. Here it is. The first problem is that sometimes people come to, to, they come to church looking for friends, but they get fellowship instead. And when they get fellowship instead of friends, they begin to look for what, 
what, what's not given, and they become disgruntled. Why didn't the pastor say hello to me in the foyer? Why didn't so-and-so, why weren't they or there for me in my day of trouble? Why weren't they there for me? And let me tell you, I just want to say as pastor of Church, it is our desire. It is our heart. It is our passion. It's what we live for, to be a church that cares. We want to be there in the mountaintops and in the valley moments. We want to be a church that we are there for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But let me tell you, we're imperfect. And sometimes when we come to church, we're looking around, where is my friends at? But we're given, we're given fellowship instead. See, fellowship is a commitment around a common purpose. How many love Jesus this morning? See, we're here today because we love Jesus. We're here to worship Jesus. But, but, but friendship is your ride or die. It's that person that's not just going to bail you out of prison. It's going to be the person who's probably in prison with you, right beside you. That's what, it's that person who's going with you no matter where you go, what's going on. I'm, I'm with you right there. See, see, and sometimes we get, because of this misconception or because of this, this expectation that can't be lived up to, we become disenfranchised or discouraged. The second one that's there is you come to church looking for friends, but you get a family instead. Now, you say, man, praise the Lord. I thank God for this church. I, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to boast. I think this is one of the most amazing church families on the planet. I love our church family. I love being out there in the foyer. I love connecting. I love greeting. I love our pastoral team here that, that are out there connecting and greeting because we, we are a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. That, that, that the blood of the cross is thicker than the water of the womb. I believe in the church of Jesus Christ. I believe in the, in the koinonia within the church. But you know what? I don't know what your family is like, but I think every family has a few crazy uncles and a few crazy aunts along the way. Don't act like your family's all that perfect. Don't look like you got it all together in your family. And just because you're part of this beautiful church, this beautiful church that's a global work around the world, don't be surprised that sometimes there's going to be some people within the family of God that are going to let you down from time to time. Don't be surprised that there will be some souls and there will be some Jonathans within the church. But here's the amazing thing. Listen, we got, when we find friendship, friendship is not something that you get overnight. Friendship is not something that you find by just signing up to a discipleship group. Friendship is something that is forged in the fire. Friendship is something that is born for the day of adversity. Friendship is something that's born over years of loyalty and sacrifice and commitment to one another. Friendship is something that is birthed over years and years and years. And we gotta, when we find our friends, let me tell you, if you have a friend today, you're a blessed person. You are, if you can, they say this all the time, if you can find in your lifetime five people that you can count as Jonathan type friends in your life, you've had a blessed life, life altogether. You hold on to your friends. You fight for your friends. You go to battle for your friends. They may, they may not attend the same church as you, but if they are your friend, you value that friendship. You, you fight for that friendship. I just want to let you know today, whether you decide to be at the Springs Church or not decide to be at the Springs Church, you're still part of the family of God. We still love you. We still consider you a brother or sister or Christ. There are no stepchildren in the kingdom of God. You are, you are part of what God is doing. Your friends might not live in the same zip code as you. Your friends, you may not have spoken for years, but how many of you know when you've got that friend that sticks closer than a brother, you can, after 10 years, you can meet them and you just can step right back into the friendship all of a sudden, all of a again. They may change over time. Philosophies might change. But let me tell you, that friendship is incredible. And what's amazing right here? Let there be light. <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it, y'all. Authentic people trust in Christ. Praise the Lord. Yeah, amen, amen. So anyway, what was I talking about? I was talking about friendship. You got a friend in me. Friendship, friendship that honors friendship, that, that, that helps, and friendship. Listen, here's a second covenant. You know they made a second covenant with each other? In 1 Samuel 20, 14 to 16, when Jonathan is stepping out to help David, even amongst his family, even amongst his own kingdom, even amongst his own, own people, and he's making this, they make another covenant with one another. In verse 16 of chapter 20, it says, so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. In other words, the second covenant was, 
was your enemies are now my enemies and my enemies are now your enemies. If somebody's going to come to you, they got to get through me first. If somebody's going to get to me, they got to come through you first. What a picture of the relationship. When Jesus calls us friends, whoo, let me tell you, his, his enemies, our, our enemies, they got to get through the blood of Jesus first. They got to get through the God who's the king of the universe, the God who spoke this world into existence. There is nothing that can get through to you because his arm is not too short that it cannot save. They were making a friendship and a pact with each other that I'm there for you. No matter what happens after these years, we will stand with one another through whatever happens. Three, authentic friendship heals. Authentic friendship heals. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15 to 18. The final point is this. Friendship that heals. This is the final encounter that we see between David and Jonathan, and it's a profound one. Nestled here is Jonathan is fleeing, or David is fleeing, excuse me, David is fleeing from Saul. And it says, so David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness. Anybody ever found yourself in the, in the wilderness, facing a desert season? And David is in the wilderness, in the forest. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods, in the wilderness. And here it is, he strengthened his hand. And he said to him, do not fear for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed in the woods and Jonathan went to his house. Here we see three different things that happen here in this final, in this final part. Saul is pursuing Saul is pursuing da David, and Jonathan comes out to meet David. Isn't it amazing that the one who's pursuing his life to kill him cannot find him, but his friend can find him where he's at, can find him in the wilderness, can meet him in this moment. And you think to yourself, why would David trust Jonathan? Here he is, having a relationship, having a friendship this deep friendship with Jonathan of the same household, the same kingdom, as the same one who's pursuing his life to kill his life. It's amazing that within the same kingdom, you have one who's of the family that's trying to kill him, and you have one who's trying to heal him. Listen, family can be crazy sometimes, but don't give up on the church. Don't give up on what God is doing. Just because you've been hurt, just because somebody has let you down, just because somebody has, has, has not measured up to what the church should be or what the representation of Christ on the earth should be, and you feel like, why should I trust anymore? Why should I build friendship anymore? Why should I make an effort anymore? Why should I pursue that anymore? Let me tell you, in the church of Jesus Christ, yes, for every soul there is a Jonathan who will pursue, who will find you out, will call you in the night, will text you in your wilderness, We'll find you in that moment and we'll come alongside you to be with you even in that moment. Let me tell you, a broken relationship, it's never worth it. It's never worth it. I've been walking with the Lord now 20 plus years. I've been in ministry since in my late teens. I got brought into ministry. And I've watched over and over again the breaking of relationship and it's never, ever worth it. The fruit on the other side is never worth it ever worth it. The only thing that I will put in as a caveat is there are sometimes that people will cross a line in your life. You get counsel, you get people that you can process up to, you find some healthy places, and there might be sometimes, whether it's in a marriage or whether it's in a friendship, that you might have to step away, that you might have to make a decision. But let me tell you, just over whatever, man, a breaking of a relationship, man, we got to fight for the relationships. We got to fight for the friendships that, that we have. Here we, here we see that David doesn't judge the kingdom. He doesn't judge it, the kingdom, based on a few bad situations. He doesn't face it based on, he doesn't give up on the church because of Saul. No, Jonathan comes and he finds him. In a world, in a time in Israel, where there's envy and there's deceit, and there's murder at heart, and people are pursuing each other. In the middle of it, there's this reflection of godly relationship in the middle of it. 
And let me tell you, in our world today, there is a people that is battling with isolation. There is a people that's battling with loneliness. There's a people who are looking for friends and they're looking for commitment. And they're saying, if only somebody would come and call me back. And if, I, if, if they don't call me back and if they don't give me what I want, then they're not worth being called friends for. Let me tell you, the challenge of today's message is that not that you're David, but that you're a Jonathan. Because David, if you think to yourself, man, I'm just here, I'm showing up at my church, who's going to be my friend? Who's going to be my friend? Who's going to be my friend? Let me tell you, that will always lead to a place of isolation and brokenness. But when you can flip the switch and think through Jonathan, because here's the amazing thing about Jonathan, that Jonathan gives more than he ever would receive, but he obtains a friend that he loves. And people are, they're like, man, if I could just have a friend that I love. If I could just have a friend that I love. And you think about Jonathan's like, he gives and he gives and he loves and he loves and he sacrifices and he sacrifices. And yet in the middle of that to prove that is the most beautiful image of friendship that can be found. I'm so grateful for the church of Jesus. I'm so grateful that it's at church that I have found my Jonathans in my life. I have found the people that walk this journey with me. That if I call them at 4 o'clock in the evening, they're there for me. If I go at 4 o'clock in the morning, they're there for me. If, if I'm going through a battle, they're there for me. I'm so grateful that I've got people in my life that can find me in my wilderness and call me out. And sometimes they'll come alongside me and they'll just sit in silence with me. And they'll just be there, just tell me, just, just speak to me just by being present in the room with me. And sometimes they'll come along and they'll give me the right hand of fellowship and they'll say, you get up, you lazy sod. You keep moving after the things of God. God has got a call upon your life. What are you doing here in, your, in this place? You keep walking out what God's got, got for your life. You keep going on this journey. You keep moving on this journey. Oh, that God would raise up some Jonathans in this room that would go find some Davids that have got a call upon their life but they found themselves in a wilderness and a brokenness. God, see, see, there's a beauty in this. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. This is love, that, not that we love God, but that he first loved us. What a beautiful picture of friendship. See, I just want to let you know here closing this morning is when we think about friendship, yes, I'm so grateful for the Pastor Matt Pools. I'm so grateful for the Pastor Pauls and the Pastor Tims. People, and I, man, my best friend, you know, one of my best friends that I had is when I became a Christian and I was like 12 or 13 years of age and I walked into church and I looked around the room, I can't be friends with all these People? How can, I, how can I, these are all crazy people. The church is full of crazy people. I'm, I'm like 13 years old. I'm like, looking around. I'm like, God, give me a friend. And you know, God answered that prayer. He actually sent a family in, in the 90s in Ireland. Our history is a bit different. We had the first mass immigration in the 90s after Ireland uh, joined the EU. And we had a family that joined the church from Nigeria parents were doctors and the son he loved soccer I love soccer we connected we became we became like Jonathan friends for the rest of our life he's now a doctor himself when 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 our kids have a, a, a situation we're going we're getting ready for a home fellowship one night and K Killian dropped a plate on his toe and there's you know it's a disaster and like we're ready to go to your and I call him up along the way he's like he's fine he's good the human body's amazing Put a little bit of water on it. He'll be good. Save yourself a big medical bill. You'll be good. It's good to have some friends that you can call and freak out to every one another. And they've got an answer to calm you down in the middle. I'm so grateful for the friendships that God has given me. I'm so grateful that on my wedding day, the people who stood by my side and Sarah's side were Jonathans that were along the journey. I'm so grateful for people. In my, I'm so grateful for my wife, Sarah, my closest friend in this world. I'm so grateful for the confidence that she is and how she knows me better than anybody. And if anybody wanted to sail me and show my weakness points in my life, my wife could do it, but she covers me and she loves me and she's with me. I'm so grateful for my, my wife, Sarah. But can I tell you today, there's no friend like Jesus. No, no, you got to hear me this morning. This is so important, church. There's nobody like Jesus because there will come a seasons and there will come moments in your life where not even the closest people in your life will be able to find you where you're at. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother and his name is Jesus. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24. It's got two very strange, like, differences in the translations. Half of them talks about a man who is friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And the other half of the translations often put it like this. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
See, you can have all the friends in this world. You can have all of the companions. You can have a million Facebook friends. You can have the closest confidants in this world. But there's only one friend who sticks closer than a brother. Man, if you don't know Jesus, oh, I tell you today, you're missing out on the greatest friendship of all. That you can come to him at every hour, at every moment, at every time, when nobody else has an answer for you. But I want to tell you that there is one who's got an answer for what you're going through, and his name is Jesus. When you're going through a battle, and you're going through a storm, and you're in the wilderness, and you're running, and you're fleeing, and you find yourself in a cave, and you find yourself out in the middle of nowhere, that God will find you where you're at, and he'll come beside you, and he'll remind you, I anointed you, I called you, I loved you, I'm with you, I'm, I'm going to bring you through through everything that you have in your life. I love it because it says, for a third time, they covenant with each other. This covenant is a picture of trust. It's an expression of loyal love. Now when they get to the third covenant, there's nothing left to covenant about. They've already given everything over. But this third time is just an expression that I'm still with you. I'm still going on this journey with you. I've not forgotten about you. I'm still walking this journey alongside with you. And I just want to let you know that Jesus is here to remind you of the covenant. He's already given you everything, but he's not leaving you where he's at. He's going to never leave you. He won't forsake you. He will bring you through, and he has the answer for your life. And today you might be saying, I'm praying for that friend. I'm praying for that Jonathan in my life. And along that journey, I just want to let you know that you do have a spiritual home at the Springs Church. And sometimes you just may need to come to a place that you need an Aaron or a her to come alongside you and lift up your hands in the battle and say, you're not on this journey along. We're going to strengthen your hand. We're going to be beside you. We're with you. We may not have everything, but we can lift up your hands. We can let you know that God will prevail in this battle. He will come through. He will bring you on this journey. Let me tell you my testimony. Let me tell you my story. I've been in the valley. I've been in the pit. I've been in the miry clay. I've been in the place where everybody's forgotten me. But I know that my God never fails. I know that God comes through. Oh, let me tell you about what God has done in my life. Oh, God, would you move? Thank you, Lord. Jonathan sacrificed much more than he got from David. But he got a friend whom he loved. Thank God that Jesus gave everything for us, and now he calls us friends. I don't know why he would do it for me and you. Scoundrels like me and you, ragamuffins like me and you, but he's brought us in, he's called us to be a friend. See the challenge today, church, as you stand to your feet across this place, and we get you out of here at a reasonable-ish time. On this holiday weekend, the challenge today right across this place, is not to be like a David just waiting. But my challenge is that you'll be a Jonathan. That you'll go again. That you'll go again. That you'll come to that place where you'll establish friendship. You'll help in others in their time of need. And you'll find them when they're in the wilderness. And you'll come alongside them. And be there for them. And that's season. When every eye closed and every head bowed across this place, I do want to give an opportunity here today. Maybe you can say that Jesus is your friend. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You've known about him. You've heard about him. You've heard sermons about him. You've heard grandma talk about him. You've heard your kids talk about him. But you have never given your life to Jesus. To be able to call him friend. Have a relationship with him. See, if you hear nothing else from me this morning, sir, madam, in this place today, just know that the whole thing is about a relationship. God wants a relationship with you. He wants to be the one that you would know that sticks closer than a brother. He is the one that when everything in this world fails, he will still be there to sustain you and keep you. He is the friend today. If you're here today and you would like to invite Christ to be your Lord and Savior, to come into this relationship, this friendship, that's beautiful, it's magnificent, it's the greatest friendship of all time today, I want to give you that opportunity. If you're here today, you'd like to give your life to Christ. It means that you admit that I am a sinner. I have fallen short. I'm not worthy of God. But thanks be to God that he's made a way for me to come in. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe in what Christ has done. I believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross to take away my sins. And I confess him as my Lord and Savior. 
you're here today and you say, I want to invite Jesus to be my Savior. We're not here to embarrass you. We're not here to make a show of you. This is between you and Jesus, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Every eye closed across the place, every head bowed. We're not here to make embarrass anybody here today. But I do want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus your best friend, the Lord and Savior of your life today. If that's you, would you, when I count to three, would you just lift up your hand nice and high? We want to say a prayer collectively with you this morning that you can invite Christ to be your Savior today. When I count to three, if that's you, just lift up your hand. One, two, three. If you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, would you just lift up your hand? Say, that's me. I'd like to give my life to Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here this morning? Want to give your life to Christ? Thank you. Two hands. Anybody else here? Looking up on the balcony. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Anybody? Three. Anybody else this morning? Want to give your life to Christ today? Amen. Take a fourth hand. Praise the Lord. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church. Let's pray this together as we close out this service this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for becoming our friend. I admit I'm a sinner. I've rebelled against you. I live my life according to my own plans. But today I give you my life. Come into my heart. Make me a new creation. I choose to follow you all the days of my life. You are my savior. You are my friend. You are everything. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, we put our hands together for these four people. Great decision for Jesus. Amen. I just want to say this before we worship together here this morning. Just stay where you are. No moving, please. Thank you so much. We're not just done just yet. If you're here and you just made that decision, we invite you into a journey of discipleship. You can join the other 53 if you're a young adult on that journey of discipleship, on that journey. Or if you're here and you just want to, hey, what does it mean to be a Christian? we got a Bible we want to put in your hands. We want to tell you about some next steps in this journey. You can visit our guest tier lounge, which is out in our foyer. Or you can go visit Discover the Springs, which is just through the back here after service. And we'd love to share with you, answer some questions, a little bit about what God is doing. We're going to sing one song of worship. That's it. And then we're, we're done today. One, one course across this place. I just want to invite you. If you've got a burden that's too heavy to carry, if you want to just give it to the Lord today, have some people come and pray with you this morning, then these altars are open. Come on, let's worship the Lord together this morning. If you need prayer today over anything, then this altar is open. We'll come back with we'll close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Amen.